Welcome to the London Luminaries, 14 historic properties working collaboratively to celebrate our collective history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm the host for this evening's event. As the host, I get the delicious treat to welcome you to our fantastic host uh, chair for this evening. And that is the fantastic Judith Hawley. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you to all our friends who join us again tonight. It's like having you here for a large party all, all around the table with us, perhaps. I know a lot of you come to a number of these Luminaries talks, and it's a pleasure to, to build up this relationship with you. It's also a pleasure to introduce a new Luminary to our, um, our roster. Uh, Fulham Palace hasn't been on uh, our series before, but we're delighted to welcome them now, not least because this site of Fulham Palace has an extraordinary history stretching back at least 5,000 years and is still very active and a, a place well worth visiting in the present. And our speaker tonight will be talking about a significant stretch of that history and is very well qualified to do so. Our speaker is Alexis Haslam, and he has been an archaeologist at Fulham Palace since 2017. He's worked on numerous archaeological sites, and his latest book is called Tales from the Vaults and Other Newington Horror Stories. Over to you, Alexis. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, so, yes, I will be speaking to you tonight about Fulham Palace and how the archaeology of the palace has revealed a great deal about our understanding of the diet of the bishops of London. And so I have seemingly entitled it Posh Nosh, um, which probably gives you a bit of a clue as to what the lecture will be about. For those of you that don't know Fulham Palace, um, it is indeed a scheduled ancient monument and it sits just near Putney Bridge on the banks of the River Thames. Um, it's a moated site. It was once the largest domestic moat in England, and it was acquired by the Bishop of London in 704 AD. Before that, the land had actually belonged to the Bishop of Hereford. So the site has a long history. It goes back further than that in terms of the archaeology to the Roman and prehistoric periods. But really, we're going to be talking today about the Bishop of London, with the last bishop actually not leaving the site until 1973. So here is um, a plan of the site, and it's sort of last guys with the moat still around it from 1831 and as I've said this was once the largest domestic moat in all of England so as the bishop's estate it was very much so a working farm it had gardens of course um, and fish ponds one of which you can actually still see on this map in the 19th century but obviously it was subject to a great deal of changes over the years possibly one of the most significant archaeological discoveries that we've had over the last 20 years was this hearth, which we found in our North Lawn area, just to the north of the palace where it stands today. And this was, um, this has been dated to between 1180 and 1450. So although that's quite a broad date range, a tighter date range of between 1135 and 1220 has been sort of uh, come to through analysing the tile. And this suggests that it is in fact a rather significant early tile hearth. Um, it's quite large, it was about two metres across, and you can see just in this picture here that it was surrounded by a ragstone kind of edging. So this is a significant path in the centre of what would have been a large Saxo-Norman building. So this is probably our first early medieval, as it were, hall on the site, and it's certainly the first evidence that we have for a residence during the bishop's occupation of the site. So this is a kind of typical early medieval hall that you can see here. It would have been open in the middle and you can see where the hearth roughly would have been there and obviously they're quite large um, and substantial structures uh, probably the most famous one being uh, Westminster but ours isn't actually that sm much smaller than Westminster so it's a very significant early medieval hall which sort of shows how powerful the Bishop of London was but it was really during the kind of excavations on top of this hall that we began to see kind of evidence of food waste, as it were, associated with the bishops of London. So in terms of the medieval diet, um, from the demolition deposits that we got above that structure, which was probably knocked down in the early 1200s, um, we got quite a lot of stuff. So the majority of this kind of early medieval kitchen waste is mostly the typical things you'd expect, like cattle, sheep or goat, uh, and pig. There was some veal as well, so some young uh, calves or cattle. But mostly older cattle again, 
and young um, uh, and old sheep. So a bit of mix of young and old sheep and also bacon of pigs are about two to three years old. So this is kind of a fairly typical kind of medieval diet that you'd expect for the time. It's not particularly extravagant, but at the same time, there's plenty of meat there. So the bishops and their kind of household are eating fairly well. There are also juvenile chickens and we've got both red and fallow deer, which was also quite exciting. And the discovery of fish was quite good too. So fish is often quite difficult to identify in archeological contexts. They're quite small bones. So quite often they come out of kind of environmental samples that you take. But from this, we got um, evidence of, of the bishops eating herring, which is a fairly kind of common fish, although typically eaten for breakfast. But we also got cod, um, sort of flat fish as well, um, fresh, fresh water fish as well, such as carp and salmon, trout and eel and perch. And it's possible that some of this fish is, of course, coming from the fish ponds that were present on the site. So a fairly typical kind of diet for the medieval period. Uh, a lot of meat there, though, as well, but also this fish that's present too. But perhaps the most exciting thing that we found during those investigations um, was with the remains of a pike that was over 100 centimetres long. So this is actually a really, really big pike. And buying something or purchasing something like that at the time would have cost between two to three shillings in the later medieval period, that is. And that is roughly equivalent to the weekly wage of a skilled craftsman. So you can see that this would have been a very, very expensive dish to have served up. Um, and it would not have been um, a, sort of, uh, a cheap meal. This would have been very much so uh, a centerpiece uh, at a kind of dinner or something like that. I've never personally eaten pike, but apparently it can be all right. Um, but of course, uh, the main thing we need to remember here is the fact that the bishop owned the fishing rights to the manor of Fulham. So that is the stretch of the river alongside the manor in Fulham. Those fishing rights belong to the bishop and he could, of course, uh, rent those fishing rights out. So presumably he was getting a fairly good deal on any kind of fish that was caught. So moving forwards to about 2017 here, which is where I started at the palace, and this was my first excavation there, um, I was asked to search for uh, the palace's long lost dovecot. So this is quite an important plan that we have here that shows the palace in the kind of, um, in the late 18th century prior to its redevelopment. So if you can see uh, my pointer here, we have our lovely, uh, late 15th century Tudor courtyard just here, whereas still standing at the time was our medieval court, the palace in the eastern courtyard just here, about to be knocked down by this point in time. But just down in the corner here was the palace dovecot. So my job was to try and find this dovecot during the archaeological excavation. So before the project, we actually undertook a geophysical survey. So we were looking for the dovecot using geophys. Um, we had to get scheduled monument consent from Historic England because obviously the site is a very important scheduled ancient monument, so we can't just go around digging holes wherever we like. Um, so we were, also, we were mainly interested in looking for the dovecot, but also you can see this rather interesting red streak across the top that we were also quite intrigued in looking for. So this excavation, um, most of the archaeology that we do at the palace is very much so community driven. So this was an opportunity um, for volunteers and for school groups to hand dig on the site of a scheduled ancient monument under professional archaeological supervision. So there are the two trenches that we excavated. You can see the large one, the large red area to the bottom, which is trench one, and the smaller uh, sort of rectangle to the north, which is trench two. But we're very much so going to be concentrating on trench one here. So this was the trench um, when it was opened up. But probably the most important thing that you can see that relates to the talk that I've been giving today is that we have a feature just down here running along there, which was a fact a great big ditch. And you can see we've cut two excavation slots just across it, just there. So these are the two slots that we excavated. Um, we only got half of the ditch. As you can see, it's quite big. Um, volunteers there digging away um, and finding lots of very exciting and very interesting things. So from excavating the ditch, you can see we've got this lovely um, freck and stoneware jug that, that came out of it. And from this that we've discovered that the ditch was infilled uh, between 1480 and 1550. And this is particularly interesting in the sense that the, um, the Great Hall um, in the Tudor Courtyard, uh, we've undertaken dendrochronological dating on that, so tree ring samples, 
And that's given us a construction date between 1493 and 1495. So we're looking at a very late 15th century Tudor courtyard here. And it's during this period that our big ditch is filled in. So it looks like the ditch originally would have been medieval, but it is backfilled and closed between 1480 and 1550. So we've got lots of nice pottery just out of those two slots, don't forget, they're only one metre wide. So very little of the ditch was actually dug. But we've got a lot of pottery which comprised sort of local redwares, German stoneware, and mostly these are in the form of drinking vessels, as well as, well as sort of cistercianware in the form of cups and jugs. So these are quite high status kind of um, uh, sort of vessels that we're seeing here, a lot of them imported. So this is all fitting in with what we call the culture of a Renaissance high status household. So as you would expect, for bishops and lovers at the time, who were all incredibly powerful, we're seeing a lot of this kitchen where and kitchen waste going into the backfill of this ditch. And this is, of course, telling us a great deal about the Bishop of London and the Bishop's household. But perhaps what was the most exciting part of digging out this ditch was, in fact, the animal bone. And we got absolutely loads of it. So this really gives us a great insight into what's being consumed at the palace between 1480 and 1550. And that you, you can see in the top picture on the left, there's butchery marks there. So this material is deriving from the kitchens. So we're getting the usual stuff again, as we got in the medieval period, we're moving into the post medieval here, but we're getting cattle again, we're also getting sheep and goats, but we're also starting to see uh, different forms of food emerging. And we got some rather interesting critters out. So as I've entitled this slide, nom nom nom, indeed, we got some very tasty treats. So we have um, rabbits, uh, particularly small bunnies, which is quite interesting. We have doves and squabs again, which may well relate to the sort of the dove house. We have suckling pig, which is obviously um, very tasty indeed, I believe, and venison again. So some really interesting sort of cuts of meat that are coming out of the, uh, the bishop's kitchen. But also some slightly stranger things as well, like song thrush that perhaps was used to decorate a rather fancy meal. We've got pheasant again, quite high status. Interestingly, we've got small chicks, which may possibly suggest association with falconry on the site. We did get some evidence of kestrel and also red kite, although red kites generally seem to be kind of a scavenger at the time and more of a pest than anything else. And we also got duck. But perhaps the most exciting thing that we found um, beyond that was again fish that we had earlier on. And in fact, um, it was actually the keen eyes of the young archaeologists that I had on site who were really, really good at picking out fish bones. We did, of course, some, um, sample the, the fills of the ditch again, and they were sieved uh, back, in, um, back in the archaeological office for, for, um, for bones. Um, but again, having, having a young archaeologists on site was really great, and uh, they were really good at picking out fish bones. So again, we see salmon, and we've got um, sort of place and flounder again in terms of uh, flatfish. We've also got ling, which is actually traveling a bit of distance to get to the site because that's not uh, something you get out of the Thames. We've got thornbacked ray, and um, that's being eaten as well, as well as cod again. So fish is very much so a significant and important part of the bishop's diet. But moving on, one of the strangest things that we found was turkey bone. And this is important in that um, the first historical reference we actually have to Turkey in Europe dates to 1520. So if you think about the backfilling of our ditch, that took, between, took place between 1480 and 1550. This is actually a really early turkey bone. So turkeys are understood to have first been introduced to England by William Strickland, somewhere between either 1524 or 1526 when he brought them back to Bristol. And bones associated with turkeys have previously been discovered in Exeter, dating between 1520 and 1550, and at St Albans between 1534 and 1550. So it looks like our kind of turkey bones probably date to somewhere between 1524 or 1526 and 1550, which makes it London's earliest evidence for turkey, which is very exciting. Something we talk a lot about at Christmas, have a little bit of a row with Exeter and St Albans about who's got the earliest turkey. But it seems that they were in fact, obviously first brought in rather than to be consumed and eaten. Uh, they're rather uh, strange and interesting looking creatures and they fan rather like a peacock. Um, so they were probably originally brought in as display birds. So um, this again is a map of the palace and uh, there was a slaughterhouse associated with it. Um, so in 1647, um, 
after the civil war, during the civil war, um, the bishops were got rid of and the palace was actually um, put up for sale. So a parliamentary survey was undertaken to raise money for, for parliament um, as they sold the land. And this is actually quite helpful uh, for me from an archeological perspective and that it records what was present on the site. There's no map, but there's a written document. So this does, of course, record um, a kitchen garden just down here to the south of the palace um, with kitchens in the southwest corner just here. But there's a slaughterhouse just down here and our ditch was just here. So you can see there's not a huge distance between that slaughterhouse and the ditch which was being infilled which is probably quite a convenient place to get rid of the kitchen waste. But that, of course, has given us a real insight into the, the diet of the bishop and his household during the early Tudor period. So the dovecot, um, as that I was supposed to be looking for, you'll notice I haven't really mentioned it much here, um, is certainly still around at the time of the 1647 survey. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't find it in our excavation. We think it's a little bit further to kind of to the northwest. But again, we got doves. Um, so they're quite significant and uh, would have been uh, important at the palace, um, both for food and for feathers, etc., and also for the guano that they produce. But at the time, um, dovecots could only actually be owned by a lord of the manor. Um, so it's quite significant to have a, a dovecot and quite a status symbol. So sadly, the dovecot was knocked down by Bishop Terrick. Um, it was recorded as an, in a poor state in 1763. It needed a lot of work on it. It's going to cost about 18 pounds, five shillings and three pence to repoint it, fix the tiles and the turrets, repair the door, etc. So unfortunately, by 1764, it really wasn't a bad, bad way. It was full of rats. And so they decided to pull it down. And sadly, as yet, I still haven't managed to find it. But I did find out quite a lot about the bishop's diet. So we'll take that as a as, as a significant find, I think. So Using that kind of um, 1647 parliamentary survey, we've had to do quite a lot of work to try and work out perhaps what the grounds of our palace looked like and what might have been going on there because our gardens were completely knocked down in 1764. You can see on this plan we have our current uh, walled garden which dates that period, but all of our Tudor, um, Tudor gardens were destroyed, unfortunately. But we do have the record of what was there. So we know there was a kitchen garden to the south of the palace which would have been used for growing sort of uh, vegetables, etc. A plum garden, and there was a walled orchard, a little orchard as well, a stone gallery garden, which probably would have been the quite fancy bit where all the kind of um, uh, knock gardens were, and also a grape garden, a rose garden, which were kind of the kind of um, the sort of high status sort of places that you went for nice walks. Um, so that's kind of the layout we think of what our Tudor gardens look. So the interesting to think about, again, about those gardens is, of course, what is Fulham producing? So we know it's a working farm. We've seen evidence of the meat uh, and the kind of animals they're eating through the archeological evidence. Um, but, but what else is being grown there? So what else is Bishop producing for his dining table? So we know from that text, there's plums because there's a plum garden mentioned. There's also two apple lofts and we've got those orchards as well. So we know they're there. There's a bakehouse in the southwest corner of the Tudor courtyard. Apples, of course, apart from just being able to eat them, you can dry them and also produce cider with them. And this all very much so fits into that Tudor concept of a garden as, as representing both profit and pleasure. So the profit is what it produces, often sending um, that produce as gifts. Uh, and as a means of extending the hand of friendship. So actually during the Tudor period, sort of um, sending people your produce is, a, is a very much so seen as a significant form of sort of friendship and loyalty. And probably our main, most famous episode at Fulham Palace um, revolves around Bishop Edmund Grindle, who was Bishop of London between 1559 and 1570. And he was very much so famous for growing grapes for the palace. And he regularly sent these grapes to Elizabeth I and also to William Cecil. But unfortunately for Grindel, in 1569, he was accused of attempting to poison the Queen. Um, he sent a servant to deliver them to him, to her, um, but she accused this servant of suffering from the plague. Apparently he did die a few days later. So uh, Grindel was a bit worried about what was gonna happen to him, sending a, a sort of diseased servant round. But fortunately it all worked out fairly well for him in the end because he was made Archbishop of Canterbury, so he must have done something right. But um, when you look at this picture here, this is the very last remnant 
um, if you ever visit the palace and you look at the uh, the walled garden as it stands today, this red brick section is the very last remnant of our Tudor walled orchard. So this is all that's left of our Tudor garden. But in, inside the wall, you can see these three kind of arches uh, in the wall. And it's quite good fun to ask visitors to the site what they think they are. They are, in fact, bee bowls. So they would, these would have been originally internal to the wall. So you can see when uh, Terek uh, built the new walled garden in 1764, he reused one element of that Tudor garden uh, to create the new walled garden. Um, so these bee bowls, they were blocked in in the 18th century when the wall garden was constructed and they were only um, sort of uh, unblocked in the early 2000s as the restoration projects began to take place. So the term bowl is quite interesting in that it derives from the Welsh word bolch or wilch, not that my Welsh is particularly good, uh, but that means gap or notch. So bee bowls are quite significant in that at the time, of course, now we think of the modern beehive, but back then, um, they had to be kept in those sort of typical Winnie the Pooh type uh, beehives or skeps as they're called. So we know beekeeping goes back a really long way um, to at least the Roman times, but bee bowls themselves that actually house these kind of skeps within gardens don't seem to have emerged until the late 15th century. So it's quite significant that we've got these fairly early bee bowls. They remain popular into the 17th and 18th centuries. And um, until the invention of the movable wall frame in 1862, skeps continue to be used. So uh, they've got quite a long history, and it's quite important that we understand that obviously beekeeping uh, was quite a significant um, part of the palace gardens. So this again feeds into the concept of profit um, and pleasure again, with the sort of Tudor concept of profit there, with the bees producing honey, which can be used for a sweetener. Again, this is in the days before sort of sugar, uh, mead and metheglin, which is a kind of medicinal mead, as well as beeswax, which could be used for candles. And these bowls are generally organized in rows on the insides of gardens um, to protect, you know, the gardens are obviously protected from the elements uh, through walling them. So we don't know how many bowls we would have had because we've only got three left in this wall, uh, but they would have been within the walled orchard. And we can kind of assume that the other walls probably had some as well. Bees also feed into the concept of pleasure in the fact that the bees make a nice buzzing noise and they're quite a nice thing to have in your garden as well. But perhaps uh, the most famous bishop at Fulham Palace, particularly in terms of the botanics, is Henry Compton, who was Bishop of London between 1675 and 1713. He's essentially working within those Tudor gardens and the orchards laid out by Bishop Fitzjames. But he's as the Bishop of London is kind of in charge of the, the Church of England in the colonies, he's taking this as a bit of an opportunity to get new and interesting plants sent back from the new world, as it were. And he's growing them for the first time at Fulham Palace. So Fulham Palace has got an incredible botanic history. So we don't know if Compton removed the orchards um, himself, but by the time of the rope map, which is about uh, seven, um, 1745, uh, the orchards are gone. Um, but we can sort of understand that Compton's essentially working within those Tudor, Tudor gardens. Um, and it was only Terek who removed those, those Tudor gardens, replacing them with the walled landscape uh, or the walled garden and the classic kind of Brownian landscape, which comes in at the time. But Compton was uh, interesting, not only for his botanics, but the fact that he quite liked growing things that he could eat too. So he was quite into growing kind of chili peppers, the, um, the capsicum fruitescens, and he actually used to crush the seeds up from that and used that instead of pepper. So he liked a little bit of spice in his life, I think. Um, and he also ate the flowers of the Judas tree in his salads too, which is um, something we occasionally think about introducing to our cafe, but um, I don't think the cafe staff are kind of quite with us on that one yet. Uh, but yeah, sort of interesting twists that are kind of going on there. There's the rope map I was mentioning to you. Um, again, you can see sadly by that point, the orchards are gone. Um, but Again, we go back to that brick house, uh, that brick dove house, which is on the rope map just there. And also, <clears throat> it's interesting to see how many fish ponds there are still extant up the top as well. So fish very much so playing um, a significant part of the diet. Moving forward into the 19th century, we continue to find bits and bobs and uh, bits and pieces around the palace. And when we were restoring our brickwork um, in about 2018, 
we discovered rather a lot of walnuts and wine bottles which had been shoved into the main Tudor entrance um, stuffing up the cracks as it were between the brickwork and the timber posts. So we got walnut and almond shells again which is quite interesting but also these rather intriguing um, uh, English wine bottles so we probably think maybe the sort of uh, the labourers at the time were enjoying um, a kind of <laughs> a fairly uh, loose lunch shall we say of nuts and, uh, and wine and then kind of disposing of their waste in the gaps before they kind of blocked it all up. But as I've mentioned before, the last bishop left the site in 1973 and the palace was then taken over by the council. So this was then a sort of fairly kind of long period of decline for the palace. By the early 2000s, it was in right, really a rather poor state. Um, and since then, we've been fortunate with our um, heritage lottery funded restoration projects to really bring the palace and the palace grounds back to life. So I got to take another excavation in 2018, the new planting beds between the All Saints Church um, and the Wall Garden. But unfortunately, we discovered that this area um, in, the in the sort of uh, the late 20th century had been used to dump leaves and street sweeping. So it was being used by the council as kind of a waste area. And that really perhaps represents the kind of the era of, of the death of fine dining at the palace, as it were, because all that we discovered in those kind of street sweeping elements were rather interesting crisp packets. So we're down to packets of crisp, 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 crisp by now. Uh, this one was quite funny in that it had a sort of slim disc uh, kind of offer on it. Um, I think this was probably a flexi disc. And yeah, this is cheese and onion flavor and the glitter band, as you can see there, obviously cheese and onion. So yeah, the era of fine dining, definitely dead at Fulham Palace by the 1970s. But as I was mentioning, we really are trying to, um, to bring the palace back to life. And with our restoration projects, we think it's going quite well. And in 2011, the palace was taken over by an independent charitable trust. And we'd like to think that our drawing room cafe, which you can see in this picture here, is bringing a little bit of that fine dining back to what was once a very high status household, as you can see from the archaeological material that we've recovered from it. So um, that brings me to the end of my lecture. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, Fulham Palace, obviously, we, we're very much so dependent on our volunteers. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, please get in contact at the email on the screen at the moment. Um, the sort of the main areas that we have volunteers in are very much so in the gardens, um, front of house as well um, in our education department too. And obviously if I, if I get the, when I get the rare opportunity to undertake an archeological excavation at the palace, I very much so uh, embrace taking uh, people interested and intrigued by archeology span on. So there's, there's very much so a broad kind of plethora of things you can get involved with at the palace. And if you are interested, please volunteer Sharda, who's in charge of our volunteering, as uh, volunteer at fulhampalace.org. Thank you very much. I shall now hand you back to Judith, who will um, talk to you more about upcoming talks. Thank you so much, Alexis. That was absolutely fascinating. There's so much there that I that I I didn't know. I mean, I knew that people ate fish in the past, but I certainly didn't know all that history. And if you've been um, interested by what um, Alexis had to say about Fulham Palace, you might be particularly interested in in some of our um, previous and upcoming talks where we have other. Um, institutions and buildings which have been through these changes of, of ownership and have really involved their communities. I'm thinking of places like Gunnersbury Park, um, Boston Manor House, um, Orleans House, and uh, the talk which will round off our season is the, the marvellous Pits Hanger, which uh, combines uh, council ownership, fine dining, art, all sorts of amazing things. So that was that was brilliant. Thank you.